Hi, Fast Fan. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Craig Lieberman, and I've been tinkering on cars since 1980. I've owned more than 40 cars in my life. Some were heroes, some were zeros. But never in my wildest dreams would I ever guess that three of my cars would go on to star in a motion picture franchise. My Supra, my GTR, and my Maxima all had starring roles in Universal's Fast and Furious movies. Over the next three years, I'd serve Universal as a technical advisor. I helped choose the cars, procure the parts, oversee their build, and support both production and post-production. I've got some great stories to tell, and that's why I created this channel. I hope you like the video. As Universal prepares to launch its ninth film in the Fast and Furious series, it's only natural to look back at the 20-year history of the franchise. Back in 2001, Universal released the first movie of the series, and it was a movie that focused on a street racing crew like no other movie had ever done before it. The producers of that movie were clear about their intent. The cars were to be the stars. The cast was largely made up of unknown actors, most of whom were at the very early stages of their career. On a $38 million budget, the movie grossed $211 million and had a $40 million opening weekend, which was pretty good. On June 6, 2003, Universal released Too Fast, Too Furious. With John Singleton directing, this whole new production team built upon the success of the first movie. The predictable plot focused on snaring Carter Verone, a high-level criminal set against the background of illegal street racing. On a $76 million budget, Universal took in $50 million in the first weekend and $236 million worldwide. Also pretty good. But by box office standards, this was mediocre. In 2006, a whole new production team was brought in for the next film. Justin Lin and his crew were tasked with producing a movie about a new fad that they were calling drifting. This was my favorite movie of the franchise, but audiences didn't like it as much as I did. And what do I mean by that? The movie cost $85 million to make and opened to a hugely disappointing $23 million opening weekend. Not good. In total, the movie only made $158 million globally in ticket, wides and ticket sales worldwide. In fact, it made $95 million outside the U.S., and inside the U.S. it was a dismal $62 million. After these disappointing results, Universal was getting worried that the franchise had simply run out of gas. Had the street racing plots lost their appeal to the global audiences? Figuring this out was critical as Fast 4 was already in the works. For Fast 4, Universal seemed to have run out of ideas. In essence, they copied the recipe from the first movie. It starts off with a gas truck hijacking sequence. Apparently, gas was very expensive in Dominic Toretto's world. But instead of switching to Priuses, the crew bands together to steal a gas truck. Sure, why not? Meanwhile, Lady gets murdered, and Dom and the family must avenge her death. Of course, the razor-thin plot line aside, on a budget of $85 million, this movie made $363 million, despite the fact there was no street racing in it. This was way beyond Universal's expectations, because based on the box office numbers, it was suggested that audiences just didn't care as much about street racing as they cared about car crashes and explosions. Fast Forward success encouraged Universal and Justin Lin and basically, Justin was now given permission to reboot the series. As Universal geared up for Fast Five in 2010, big changes were happening over at Universal Pictures. For starters, Adam Fogelson and Donna Langley became co-chairpersons in charge of Universal a year before in 2009. They knew about the Fast franchise and believed it should go forward, but Fogelson and Langley saw a roadblock ahead when they assumed their roles at the head of the studio. So how long would the franchise, or could the franchise, last as it is? That was the big question. In an interview bit with Fogelson back then, he said, and I quote, the question while putting together Fast Five and Fast Six for us was, can we take it out of being a pure car culture movie and turn it into being a true action franchise in the spirit of those great heist films made 10 or 15 years ago? Universal essentially decided that the next installments had to be less about street racing and more about the subject matter that appealed to a wider audience. Fogelson also added, We've heard so many people say, I've never seen one of the movies and I've never wanted to see one when talking about the Fast franchise. That was a big red light. So if these movies were still about street racing, he said, there was probably a ceiling on how many people would buy tickets. 
common sense. In other words, based on all of Universal's research, the vast number of audience members that they tested didn't care about the street racing elements. When they surveyed potential movie audiences about the Fast and Furious movies, the vast majority of test audiences also said that they hadn't seen any of the movies because they just don't care about street racing. The studio executives gathered reams of data and it all pointed to the same conclusion. Audiences want action movies with explosions, fights, and so on. Fogelson in the same interview went on to say, we wanted to see if we could raise the franchise out of the street racing world and make car driving ability just a part of the movie, like those great chases in The French Connection, The Born Identity, The Italian Job, Ronin, and so on. With Dodge now as a partner, he went on to say, our strategy behind one of the biggest bets we've ever made is that the business has gone so far towards CG action every weekend that we really believe creating a movie with real action and real cars would be amazing stuff to people who are excited by seeing something real. In other words, we're gonna take Dodge's money. Before releasing Fast Five, like all the other films, it was shown to test audiences. These audiences rated Fast Five the highest they've ever rated any Fast and Furious moving in testing. Fast Five cost $125 million to make and brought in $626 million in, in the box office. And on open weekend, opening weekend, it made $86 million. That is a profit of a half a billion dollars. At this point, the recipe was perfected. In Universal's mind, it went like this. Use a culturally diverse cast. Add in music suitable for the projected audiences, like Cardi B would be an example. Rely on big explosions to keep the adrenaline going in the audience. Don't let these actors talk too much just to further the plot. Ignore the laws of physics. Crazy driving is always exciting to watch and it doesn't matter if they crash because they're going to change cars in the next movie anyway and oftentimes in the next scene, so the cars will be transient. We can argue this all we want, but Universal has the data proving that this recipe works. Action movies are what audiences want, not street racing. To quote others, facts don't care about your feelings. In plain English, Universal has done the research and the overwhelming majority of audience surveys and the box office numbers clearly support one conclusion. They have essentially embraced the notion that these movies are still car movies so long as they show wild cars, which they've been doing in every movie. They've worked hard to make their movies appeal to the majority, not to a minority of fans who favor tuner cars. With a culturally diverse cast, Universal tried to appease a wider audience. For Fast 7, the audience transformation was complete. According to Universal, 75% of the audience in North America was non-Caucasian generally in line with previous installments of the films. Hispanics, the most frequent moviegoers in the U.S., made up the majority of the ticket buyers at 37%, followed by Caucasians at 25%, African Americans at 24%, and Asians at 10%, and other was at 4%. This explains the cultural diversity in the cast, the music choices, and the shift away from the American street racing scene. The movie needs to appeal to global audiences, as I've been saying. Just before the release of Fast 8, Vin Diesel flat out said, our characters have evolved into a kind of save the world status, so it's hard to justify a race anymore in this universe. So we were adamant about trying to find the perfect place to set that up, and the idea that we were able to make this race about honor was such a cool thing and such a throwback to the first movie, ironically. He was referring, of course, to the race scene in Cuba at the start of Fast 8. In other words, the fact that they had any one-on-one -on -one race in Fast 8 was their way of paying homage to the concept of honor as it was portrayed in the first movie. The last two movies in the series, Fast 7 and The Fate of the Furious, both made over $1 billion worldwide with the majority of the box office ticket sales coming from overseas markets. These movies made over $390 million in China alone. Again. This has been accomplished by largely ignoring the street racing culture. The global audience makes up the largest share of the box office take, so any movie studio must make their movies with global appeal in order, in order to succeed. Movie making is a business, right? It's not a charity. Motion picture studios are required to make money for their investors. That is their job. And if they don't, they're out. They're not going to make a movie that they know will lose money just to satisfy a tiny, minuscule portion of the global audience. It just doesn't make fiscal sense. But for those fans who were there from the beginning, many have found themselves tuning out after Tokyo Drift. Arguably, these are the fans that put the franchise on the map in the first place. 
Others tuned out after Paul Walker died for obvious reasons. To some, he was the franchise. These fans want to see a return to the street racing culture. Universal has largely ignored this audience, and they will continue to do so unless they get some kind of wake-up call. In Universal's mind, the movies are still about cars. It's hard to deny that cars have been much better in each of the movies. They have. In the first movie, we were seeing $25,000 cars. In some of the later movies, we're seeing $2 million cars. Clearly, we moved up the food chain in cars. For those who would say they'd rather see cars that average people could own rather than supercars, you are in a tiny minority of the global fan base. That is a fact. Most people around the world would rather see supercars than our beloved tuner cars. The box office data proves this without question. One could argue though that since these movies are so popular, bringing back street racing would still make for a successful movie. I don't think Universal is about to gamble with the proven recipe. This is a business after all, and people's livelihoods are at stake. Still, with the movie gearing up for a planned 10th movie, I think there's a solution, perhaps even a way to make an action movie and still integrate the street racing culture. Hear me out. So in Fast 10, with Dom and Brian both having children in their world, Little Jack and Little Brian could be used to catapult the franchise into the next generation, whether it's a post-credit feature or something integrated into the story. Maybe bring Jesse back, bring some of the cars from the first movie back, acknowledge the past, even if it's just a scene after the credits where Dominic takes his son Brian out to a secret garage and reveals the cars that he's been holding on to for the last 20 years, like his Charger, his RX-7, and maybe even the Super that he won from Brian. Who knows? Could be any number of things. Whatever it is, an homage to the street racing culture would show Universal's appreciation to the fans who helped make the franchise what it is today. But for me personally, I'll see the ninth film with high hopes and low expectations. At this point, it's just a guilty pleasure. That's it for this episode, everybody. I'll be back next week for another look at one of the movie cars. Thanks again for watching.